Welcome to MuggleCast, your weekly ride into the Wizarding World fandom. I'm Andrew. I'm Eric. I'm Micah. And I'm Laura. On today's episode, we are going to share what we would change in the Harry Potter books and movies. This is going to be a really fun discussion. Unfortunately, of course, we are not in control, so we can't be as optimistic about change as Taylor Swift was in her 2008 song, Change. Taylor's version available now. But we're going to complain (laughs) about these things anyway. I don't think anybody here understands the reference that I just made. Maybe Eric did. I do. Okay. I do. Okay. Very nice way of working in uh, current news to <laughs> not not current non HP news into the uh, news HP podcast. Nice work. We're gonna just jump straight into our discussion today. So this is not a discussion about plot holes. We've done that before. This is about our top annoyances with the writing, the overall character arcs, the covers the titles, directing, etc. those types of things. And each of us brought to the table one thing we would want to change about the movies and one thing we would, we would want to change about the books. And we also received feedback from the listeners. There are so many things that people submitted and we're going to have to do a part two on this, ep- on this discussion because there's a lot of good stuff to discuss. So is everybody ready? I hope nobody gets angry by the end of this episode. Okay. Everybody just, you know, kind of <laughs> try to chill. I don't know, Andrew. I'm Bringing back an old segment, I might get a little yeah. uh, frustrated. <laughs> also, I'm just looking over your first complaint here, and it seems like you have some very strong feelings about it. So we'll see how this goes. Uh, yeah, I know. I was trying to, I was basically just telling myself to not get too angry during this discussion. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, I'll kick things off, and we're going to focus on the books first. What I would change about the books are Mary Grand Prix's covers. And I'm specifically talking about books five and six, <laughs> because the books, books one through four, go from full color to these single color themes for the two books, and then back to full-ish color for the final book. And for completionists, this is just hell to me when you're looking at the books all together. She should have at least stuck with the single color theme for the final book. If she decided halfway through the series, you know what? I'm going to stick with a blue and then I'm going to stick with a green. For seven, she should have stuck with a single color as well. This is something that wouldn't bother me as a kid. I didn't really really think about it. But now I look at all the books together and it bothers me now. I, and by the way, we also, we have four illustrated editions so far, right? Order of the Phoenix, I think, comes out later this year. If they suddenly switch to a single color theme for Order of the Phoenix, just like Mary Grand Prix did, <laughs> I'm going to lose my mind. <laughs> well, Andrew, you need to get one of those book covers that's like very white. Have you seen those? Yeah. Where it's like pure white and they go over top of your existing yeah. books. That's That's what you need. That's a good idea. Yeah. People sell those on Etsy. Maybe I should do that. And um, and by the way, a related annoyance, the Corman Strike books changed up their theme and overall style, beginning with Lethal White, which I believe was the fourth book. They used to have these somewhat original covers, and I really liked them. And now they changed the design of the color of the covers, and they look like every crime novel now. They don't look unique nah. at all. And I'm like, why? So like the first two or three books look original, look unique, and then you look at four onward and they're a completely different style. It's very bizarre to me. Can anybody defend these terrible decisions? Yeah, so first of all, (laughs) Andrew, this is hell for you to look at these book covers. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Mary is not coming on the show again. Yeah. For sure. I want to see if I can help you out here. So I think... And I can understand why when you look at the covers all together for the first time and just think about them as a collective, I can understand why you might feel like, eh, like books five and six kind of stick out. But I think the reason for that is because Mary Grand Prix chose to focus on very specific scenes from the both of those books. And we know that when Harry's in the Department of Mysteries, there's blue flames. So everything does have a blue cast. And it's the same when they go to the cave in Half-Blood Prince. The potion is kind of like illuminating everything. And I think that's what she was going for. I actually found this to be a nice departure from the fourth book, which I feel like is probably my least favorite cover because it doesn't actually capture anything that happened in the book. It was like scholastic like promotional photo of the triwizard tournament that's what it felt like to me it was pretty basic (laughs) yeah laura goblet of fire is my favorite cover well goblet of fire is my favorite book 
It's just probably my yeah. least favorite cover. Um, oh, it's my favorite cover. <laughs> Harry looks happy for the first, like truly happy, and you don't get but a lot isn't of like, that, like out of line because Harry's not happy <laughs> in that book. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I, I took this discussion to mean that we were talking about like the content of the books, not in fact the damn covers. All aspects, edition. whatever you want to change. This is your opportunity. Yeah. This is what you would change given the opportunity, Andrew. You pick the covers yes. would change. Yes. But you feel like it would have felt better for you if she had gone for like a single tone theme for book seven. You could have at least been like. At least. The last three books. Okay. I get it. Right. For the most part, I would argue that the seventh book cover, it's not one tone, but it is all very like warm tones, orangey based. So yeah. I don't think that she went completely like out of left field with that cover. Um, but yeah, I mean, I understand like at first glance, but I think when you really sit down and realize, with the exception of Goblet of Fire, every other cover that Mary Grand Prix has done has featured like a specific moment from the book. Right. Um, like in Sorcerer's Stone, we have Harry playing Quidditch, Chamber of Secrets. We have them flying out of the Chamber of Secrets, Prisoner of Azkaban, them breaking Sirius out, etc. Right. Um, and I think that because she chose these very specific moments that came from the book's climaxes in five and six, she really didn't have much of a choice but to go with those single color themes because that's what it looked like. That's how it was described mm. in the books. I yeah. disagree. I, okay. I also think that what happened is that you had Harry maturing over time. And I think you saw that reflected in some of the covers, right? You were talking about sort of those single tones for Order of the Phoenix and Half-Blood Prince. But if we're really interested in knowing the answers, I did mention earlier that Mary would never come on the show again <laughs> uh, after this particular segment. But she was on the show way back in 2009 episode 172, and she actually explains the process of designing the covers, which one gave her the most difficulty, her favorite character. And she also talked about the connection between books one and seven and how there are curtains on both of them. Yes, that's And cool. how she worked to create that kind of bookend, for lack of a better term. So yeah, it was, it was a good interview. I would give it a listen. Yeah. Well, look, my, my closing point on this is that, Laura, not everything in the Department of Mysteries was blue, including the candles and the wisps and Harry's skin and the jacket. Like, everything's blue. And then the uh, Half-Blood Prince cover, everything's green. No, just – I could not live with myself if I decided to change the, the color schemes of these books halfway through the series. You I just I wouldn't live with I wouldn't, yourself. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to sleep at night knowing what I was doing to people, <laughs> ruining what their books look like altogether. In my opinion. That's just my well, opinion. The good news is there are so many different editions of these books that are available worldwide, and you can probably <laughs> find one whose art matches your personal preference. Yeah. yeah I'm going to go with the UK editions. I'll branch out a little bit. You can go to the Potter Collector. I'm sure he has some recommendations on covers. Sure, sure. Micah, what's, <laughs> what's your annoyance? Or what would you change? So the one thing that I would change that's really at the top of my list is Philosopher's Stone to Sorcerer's Stone, right? That has been uh. such a big controversy. So I would change the title of the book and the movie here in the US back to its original, which is Philosopher's Stone. And for folks who may not know, Scholastic made this decision to change the title of the first Harry Potter book because they believed it would sell better here in the United States. Clearly, however, this wasn't an issue for the rest of the entire world. So I believe <laughs> oh, oh, that Scholastic oh, made this decision because they think Americans are stupid and they don't know what <laughs> philosopher means. Micah brought his angry dad voice out. Yeah, I got scared for a second yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know what? I actually agree with you. Kids will not know sorcerer any more than they know philosopher, like what that means. So I don't, I don't really get. Well, that and wasn't change. it said in an interview that I don't know if it was with Arthur Levine or with J.K. Rowling, but they genuinely just straight up said they did not think that the word philosopher would resonate with American audiences. Like, uh -huh. yep. I know, I know, we can be stupid sometimes, but like, come on, guys. 
Well, this is also consistent with their decision to have J.K. Rowling change her name Ooh, as the yeah. author, right? She was going to be Joanne Rowling, and they said, no, you need to make your name sound more masculine or more kind of sterile and just be J.K. Rowling because if kids see that a woman is writing this book, it's not going to sell as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can't speak to the publishing industry's internal misogyny or, or or anything other than the fact that I support the decision of changing the name to Sorcerer's Stone. In preparing this sort of defense, I actually looked up the term philosopher and I really wanted to use Oxford English Dictionary. I was like, oh God, let's see what the Brits say a philosopher is. And then I found that the Oxford English Dictionary, OED.com, charges $100. So I'm not going to do that. (laughs) So Dictionary.com defines a philosopher one in several ways. Number one, a person who offers views or theories or profound questions in ethics, metaphysics, logic, and other related fields. Two, a person who's deeply versed in philosophy. Three, a person who establishes the central ideas of some movement, cult, etc. And I'll skip the middle ones. Definition six, categorized as obsolete, an alchemist or occult scientist. Now, I'm an 11-year-old, and for my birthday, I've just got the, the first Harry Potter book, and it's Philosopher's Stone. I'm like, oh my god, this is great. What is a philosopher? I'm not going to know that an occult scientist, even the word occult eludes me at age 32 for what it specifically means. I guess... Americans are stupid isn't necessarily the winning argument I thought it was going to be when I was thinking about it. But like, I I am grateful that th- that Scholastic made this change because Sorcerer's Stone with the alliteration rolls off the tongue. I know what a sorcerer is because I've grown up with like Fantasia and the Sorcerer's Apprentice yeah. and all this other stuff like the word sorcerer immediately sparks what it wants to. In me, magic, a magician, basically. I think and that's I know right. this. Philosopher did not mean philosopher, even when J.K. Rowling used it for hundreds of years. Yeah, it's more palatable. I get it. It's more. It's a lot more palatable. And in fact, I would go so far as to say all of the book titles should be Sorcerer's Stone. If you want to wow. change something, change Whoa. all the other ones. <laughs> I mean, God forbid that we learn what a philosopher is, that we do a little bit of research. And that's part of the discovery. The part of reading the actual book is to learn more yeah. about what this actually is. Now, Eric, though, I am actually really glad that you said we should rename all of the other books because that's exactly what I'm going to do. Oh, no. <laughs> what? So oh, no. I'm bringing back an old segment that hasn't been done in years called What's Bug and Micah? Oh and my God. I figured since they decided to dumb down the title for Americans for Sorcerer's Stone, I'm going to do that for every other book in the Harry Potter oh series. Oh my God. And I'll start with Chamber of Secrets. <laughs> Feel free to you know weigh in with your thoughts. I'm you know, happy to have this conversation. So I say to myself, again, if you're that age, what exactly is a chamber? <laughs> <laughs> Let's just make this as easy as possible. Harry Potter and the Secret Basement. We love basements oh, here in America. Yeah. Oh. And some even have their own snakes. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. That's, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I love it. Prisoner of Azkaban. Prisoner is no longer a politically correct term here in America. We'd have to go with incarcerated individual. And honestly, that's like a college level term. So let's just go with Harry Potter and the bad, bad man from Azkaban. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to change Azkaban because Azkaban, like, what's Azkaban? I don't, I don't care to even learn by reading the book. Bad, so, bad man. that's yeah. a good point. You could say the bad, bad man from Wizard Prison. That, oh, even better, Laura. See, we're making changes on the fly here. Uh, Goblet of Fire. Does a seven-year-old have any clue what that means? I mean, when I think of goblet, I think of drinking. And Scholastic certainly would not want to promote underage drinking. <laughs> True. Uh, therefore, we have Harry Potter and the Big Magic Cup. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> I can't wait to see the book covers that we're inevitably going to put out on social. Order of the Phoenix, I think just there's too much happening here. Uh, can we as Americans even pronounce Phoenix? 
I think it's too <laughs> Only hard. Only Arizona ends. Uh, so let's call this book what it truly is. Harry Potter hits puberty. <laughs> <laughs> Such a relatable, world-relatable topic. I agree. And a lot of us are probably going through puberty while reading this book. So. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Half-Blood Prince. We do not have princes here in America, minus the one very talented musician and the one we borrowed from the UK that now lives in Los Angeles. <laughs> We're not going to count them. We're also not very good at figuring out riddles. Oh, preach. Uh, and I think it's important to stress the moral of this book which is if you work really hard or cheat, and we love to cheat in America, you can achieve success. Uh, therefore, I'm going with Harry Potter gets good at potions. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we love to cheat in America. So true. We do. We do. You got to keep it, you know, oh got to keep God. it on point. Uh, and then finally, Deathly Hallows, right? What in the world is this title? <laughs> Philosopher was a problem, but Hallows is okay. <sighs> I'm just keeping it super simple. Harry Potter, the end. Yep. <laughs> oh, well done, Micah. Well this done. This is great. I we'll cannot, submit these to the publisher. I cannot wait to see uh, these altered book covers. I'm sure Jewel is cursing your name right now, Micah. <laughs> <laughs> is it just like? Is it just me, or would I, would would you guys also buy those books? <laughs> Like, no, well, I probably wouldn't. Those titles are really bad. Well, you, I mean, <laughs> maybe the if they point. change the color scheme on some of the covers, you'd be fine. Uh-huh. One thing I'll add, and I think we're all in agreement, if a later Harry Potter book was going to be titled Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, Scholastic would have kept it that way. They wouldn't have changed book four, knowing that Harry Potter was already well established and the title of the book wasn't going to affect sales. But because it was the first book and they weren't sure how it was going to do, they were doing what they could to make sure it sold, right? So they were setting it up for success. I don't think there's anything wrong with with that. I agree with you. I agree with you that they likely wouldn't have changed anything else later on in the series. I think to your point, they wanted to make sure that it had that initial success because also marketing becomes a nightmare if you have to do that. Now, right. for seven books. Right. Now, that said, if Harry Potter didn't blow up, maybe they would have changed all of the titles to what Micah suggested. You know, some fun facts on the What's in Micah segment, since we were questioning before recording how long ago it was that we did it, but it actually debuted on episode 55 of MuggleCast. Okay. Way back, way back when. And it, and it ran for about... What was bugging there, me there then? Were multi- it was J.K. Rowling did not update her website uh, fast enough for you. And oh. within five days, in fact, I think one of the other episodes was called Micah Gets Results. Yes. Uh, the website was updated within five days of that episode airing. There you go. So it, it really inspired us to continue that segment through, I want to say about 150 I'm looking up the transcripts now. So yeah, wow. we did it for a while. Well, I hope you enjoyed that uh, reinstallment. <laughs> so what's what do you want to change, Eric? So mine is actually relating to the plot of the books. Although I, I will say we did we did not want to do plot holes. So the, my way of sort of getting around this is talking about more of a contrivance of the plot. It basically comes down to Harry Potter is not a good student. And in fact, <laughs> he's he's not a good wizard. Um, period plus exclamation point. Um, it just, he, he over relies on his gut, uh, you know, throwing off a random expelliarmus here and there when he's in a sticky situation. My problem is that it works for him. He is allowed to continuously again and again, get out of scrapes by just using his gut or the intelligence of his friends. And over time, this ruins the overall hero's journey for me. So it just kind of gets to the point. I I know we spent hours discussing leading up to book seven in the first hundred episodes of MuggleCast, whether or not Harry would die or whether it made sense for the whole trio to survive because there's this huge wizarding war. And I think if I could remember going back, I was really excited to see Harry finally hunker down you know, learn nonverbal spells, even just get to the same level that every other wizard he knows is on. Like Snape can do wandless magic or nonverbal spells that Snape at the end of Half-Blood Prince is uh, making fun of Harry for not being able to do these things. And I was like, Harry's going to spend six months. The, like the seventh book could be years and years long because Harry's going to become a good wizard. No, it turns out he, he that's just, he just doesn't. So yet again, Harry bungles through book seven just and again in the end i'll make this short 
he kills Voldemort with Expelliarmus. So what has he learned, really? That it's good to be the hero of a major book series. Am I wrong? <laughs> Who wants to defend this? Look, if it ain't broke, don't <laughs> fix it, okay? And Expelliarmus has worked for him time and time again. Why not go with Old it's, Faithful? It's a defensive and charm. I think it's not it's even important. an offensive spell. It's defensive. Well, he's pretty much on the defensive most of the time that he's fighting Voldemort, is he yeah, not? Fair, fair. And he learned the spell from Snape, didn't he? Yeah. I, I think, you know, there's well, something vaguely. poetic about that. We, we're talking about the book here, right? Like that was J.K. Rowling's intent, that Harry's signature spell comes from the person that he hates the most. Because I think he, for the most part, throughout the series, except maybe at the end, hates Snape more than he hates Voldemort. You brought up the point that Harry isn't, that great of a student. I mean, he does earn seven owls, same as Ron. We obviously expect Hermione yeah. to do better, and she does. She gets 11. Um, but the only grades where he got below exceeds expectations were history of magic. Mm. And let's be honest, would any of us, maybe Laura would, would get you know high marks in history of magic, but I think the rest of us would just you know do the same as, as Harry. Astronomy and, uh, you know, we remember what happened during that exam, right? Hagrid getting uh, attacked and divination. So outside of that, he's a pretty damn good student, I would argue. <laughs> I guess I, I'm expecting more from the hero who's going to save the entire world that he would look up to somebody like Dumbledore and be inspired by, you know, that kind of magic, that level of magic and to see Harry not have to achieve that level of aptitude as a wizard was disappointing for me as a kid who wanted to read about this crazy hero, only to find out that he's just some 17-year-old kid who, you know, dropped out of school the last year. Doesn't that make him more likable, though, that he's not Does perfect? Does it, though? Yes. I think to some it's people more relatable it will. Because I'm not perfect. I'm glad that Harry kind of right. sucks in a lot of ways. And how he, <laughs> I too would only use one spell a lot of the time. Like, <laughs> just think of when you play a video game, you have certain moves that you really like, like in Smash Bros. Like, I love doing that Thunderbolt with Pikachu. That's like the only move I do because I like it. Be down. Oh, yeah. Same here. Right, exactly. It works really well, too. I would also just add that, you know, from a student standpoint, Harry is very accomplished by an early age in defense against the dark arts, right? Especially from what he learns from Professor Lupin. And it's that knowledge that he then takes to teaching through Dumbledore's army and equipping his classmates with a lot of what they need in order to fight moving forward because they weren't getting it from the school. So again, I'm just kind of disputing this idea that Harry well, is not... As a, a as a quick student. rebuttal to that, so much about Harry has like so much that Harry's good at comes easily to him. Riding a broom is so easy, second nature because it's it's in his blood, right? His his genes did it. His mother's protection just comes to him. His uh, wealth it just comes to him. And there's so much of it. Uh, casting a Patronus again, something that's extremely special and gifted, and and there's adults who just can't do it. And, it, you know, Harry works at it, at least with the Patronus, it takes time. But all this stuff really just does some seem to come second nature. Hermione can't even sit on a broomstick in the books without falling off. But <laughs> Harry just, the second he touches one, he's gold. And so I think that's a little uh, disappointing. Hmm. All right, Laura, what would you change? So what bugs me and what I would like to see be a little different, if I could change something is that I would have more nuanced Slytherin representation in the books. I think the best examples that we get are Slughorn and Snape. Um, you can also, I think you can put Draco in here too, because in book six, we really see him start to grapple with his role in what's going on and realize that he's bitten off more than he can chew. Um I think that it's really great that we got to see some more nuance with them. And by nuance, I mean you're not just a bad guy because you're in Slytherin or you're not just evil or you're not just dumb like Crab and Goyle because you're in Slytherin. Um, 
The overall perception of Slytherins in the core series comes across as though being born into a family of Slytherins dooms one to a lifetime of wickedness. And I think to that point, it's very clear that there's been more of an effort in Fantastic Beasts and Cursed Child to provide that more nuanced portrayal of Slytherins, which to me indicates that the author and the creators knew this was a missed opportunity because people are more complicated than one house being good and another being evil. Dumbledore even says himself in book seven, sometimes I think we sort too young. You're just boxing people in. That's not what life is like. (laughs) And I think that you do a disservice, especially to young readers, by teaching them You know, if you see somebody who holds like they're of this particular group or they hold this particular belief, they're always evil. And that's not the case. We've seen it with Lita Lestrange. We've seen it with Harry's own son. Mm. Right. Um, Well, canon canon pending. Right. (laughs) Canon, depending on your. (laughs) Well, I think the author argues that it's canon. Yeah. 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 So who wants to defend this choice? I'll touch on this a little bit because I think you did a really good job explaining, I think, a very fair, it's almost unassailable of a point because you're like, listen, I think even the creators are working to go back a little bit. What I'll say is I think the problem is that in Harry Potter, you have his school rivalry with Draco Malfoy. And so you have the natural sort of grievance there. And then you have his like Harry's least favorite teacher who openly insults students in Snape being from Slytherin. And then you have every Death Eater, uh, except for Peter Pettigrew, being from Slytherin. So it's it's a big problem because it really does paint all Slytherins as evil. I will say for the purposes of schooling, um, you know, the whole reason they sort is so that like minded individuals can be among their own. And I don't see anything wrong with a house whose primary um, goal or primary characteristic or character trait is ambition uh, being one of the primary houses of Hogwarts. I don't have a problem with that because if you look at ambition, if you look at the the, the types of behaviors, because everything can go good or can go wrong. If you look at the bad side of ambition, you get really selfish people. Uh, And I'm not saying selfish people can't exist in other houses. They certainly do. But if that's your defining characteristic um, and you're going to do what it takes at the expense of others, it makes sense that the people who end up being some of the most um, criminal, I'm treading very carefully here because I'm, you know, not equipped enough to talk about the nuance of mental health in people. But I'm saying if you look at the people who are going to be in it for themselves, it makes sense that they come from the house that values being in it for yourself. I suppose. But I think, too, you can start going down the rabbit hole of making an argument about Hermione's very ambitious. Mm -hmm. She's extremely ambitious. But the Sorting Hat didn't even think about putting her in Slytherin because why? Like the unspoken, (laughs) like... She's not pure blood enough to go there. And I just feel like uh, yeah. you're really locking readers and the characters into this assumption that all Slytherins are doomed to being prejudiced and doomed to being evil. And even when we do get, I think, Harry's first positive Slytherin representative in Slughorn, it mm. feels like Harry kind of ignores that he's a Slytherin. Because Harry likes him, right? And so Harry never observes like, oh, yeah, he's a Slytherin. Like, that doesn't happen. I think I think Harry's I I don't agree with that uh, about what Harry feels about Slughorn. I think Harry's pretty creeped out by some of Slughorn's more unsavory tendencies. But I think that's the other thing that you're mentioning is with with families that have been in Slytherin because like this happens with the Weasleys the whole families in Gryffindor all of them and that's a very common thing so in our families we inherit our prejudices and that's kind of what the character Draco Malfoy does later where he has to come to terms with the reality of the real world instead of just the pure blood mania dark lord supporting mania of his family so I think that maybe a lot of people that were you know sorted into Slytherin first picked up the habits, mannerisms, internalized beliefs of their Death Eater parents, uh, and then had to really kind of in the modern age grapple with what it means to be ambitious, but also to be 
a good person and also to be um, a little empathetic, a little understanding and not turn into more of a bigot. Um, so I, I, I'd say there's something to it in the psychology that allows for a greater uh, group of bad wizards to be from Slytherin. But I, I don't think it should be as cut and dry as it is in the books. So it's kind of a half argument. Yeah, there. so we like kind of agree. <laughs> yeah, we kind of do. But I, I would argue that if there is one place where you can hone your ambition, that actually benefits everyone. Um, it's it's like why they do, um, you know, college study programs and stuff. And there's also a lot of similarities between Ravenclaw and Slytherin. So. Yeah, mm-hmm. very true. I think part of the issue, though, comes from the fact that even – very early on in the series, Harry doesn't want to be in Slytherin. And I think that gets into our minds as readers. And then from that point forward, we're automatically thinking that Slytherin is this evil house that the people in it can do no good at all. And I also think it's unfairly balanced. So to Laura, your point about just having more nuanced Slytherin representation, I think there needs to be more nuanced representation across the board. It's it's always mm-hmm. three versus yeah, one, yeah. right? It's never it, there's never even like two versus two, or or where Slytherin is on the side of Gryffindor or Ravenclaw. Like it just seems very unless it's Quidditch, and then <laughs> you know they may seem to uh, want the other team to win, but that's about the extent of it. And I also think it's because. When you're talking about sorting too early, you're labeling kids at a very young age, right? All of these houses have specific traits that you're then assigning to these very young individuals instead of just having houses and just sorting them for no other reason than it's randomized and you're going to this house or you're going to that house. And I think it would make for a little bit less controversy. I also put this on yeah. Hogwarts leadership. It would have been very interesting to see in the books <laughs> Double door. them trying to get rid of this perception of Slytherins and really Hufflepuffs too. I mean, those two houses get bad raps in in different ways. Uh, well, I guess I guess it's more readers who hate on Hufflepuff than the actual students at Hogwarts. No, but we definitely see it in the books too. Because was it Ron? Or was it Draco? I don't remember which one of them said this, but it is very telling that I can't recall which of these characters <laughs> said this because they both share this bias. One of them said on the Hogwarts Express, like, oh, like, I hope, like, if I got sorted into Hufflepuff, I'd go home, wouldn't you? Yeah, I <laughs> like, think I'd leave. It's Draco Malfoy <laughs> in Madame Malkin's. Yeah. Mm, there we go. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Also, how current is the sorting hat? Right, like that thing has been in use for so long. Time to have an upgrade Great. to that software thing. update. Now I'm picturing the Sorting Hat, but it's been made over by like Jonathan Van Ness or somebody. Like, just <laughs> give it a touch great. up. Sorting Hat four point woke. So basically, I think what we can all agree on is that the Sorting Hat is like an outdated piece of technology. It's no longer relevant with current times. Right. So ditch it. And and I think that in, uh. UK boarding schools. I know that they actually do have houses, but to my knowledge, I don't think that they're pigeonholing children into very broad themes of like, well, you seem quite ambitious, so we're going to put you over here. (laughs) You seem very brave, and we're going to put you over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) So before we get into our biggest gripes with the movies, here's one thing we can all agree on. Feeling comfortable makes you feel good, and it starts with your first layer. That's why we here at MuggleCast love me undies, makers of the softest, most comfortable undies and loungewear. Not even a spell could replicate the cloud-like comfort you'll get when you wear a pair of me undies. They have endless styles, including limited edition Harry Potter and Hogwarts house prints that range in sizes from extra small to 4XL. Every time I put on a pair of me undies, I wonder why I would wear anything else. They just hit the sweet spot. Plus, all of their adventurous designs add a little extra joy to your day. Never run out of undies or worry about skipping laundry again with the Me Undies membership. Each month, replenish your basics and build your collection with styles that are anything but basic. Styles that let you be the truest version of yourself right down to your core. And no pressure, you can always skip a month if you want. Plus, enjoy discounted pricing, controlled shipping, and exclusive early access. I would recommend getting a membership for the Adventurous Prince so you never know what you're going to get each month. This is what I have set up, and I look forward to a fun and surprising new design every month. Love your butt and get the membership. And MeUndies has a great offer for our listeners. 
For any first-time purchasers, you get 15% off and free shipping. To get your 15% off your first order and free shipping, go to MeUndies.com slash MuggleCast. That's MeUndies.com slash MuggleCast. Let's move on to what we would change about the movies now. So, <laughs> as readers, we all care about the adaptation very, very, the adaptations very, very much. And I think there's an endless number of things we would want to change about the movies. So it was pretty difficult to just pick one thing. But one thing that really stood out to me was the Harry Voldemort free fall fight at the end of Deathly Hallows Part 2. They run around the school, Voldemort's cloak wrapping around Harry as Voldemort just like stares as it's happening. It's, it's really tacky. And then that free fall, the heads morphing into each other, flying through the sky. And I was rewatching this last night. What was Harry thinking by pulling Voldemort over a ledge? If Voldemort wants to kill you, he could have just let you go, let you crash into the ground. You wouldn't have been able to do anything <laughs> about it. I mean, <laughs> Voldemort's the one who can fly, not you. So why are you pulling Voldemort off the ledge? <laughs> <laughs> I just like Voldemort could have just let him fall to the ground and die. And that would have been it. No final duel needed. <laughs> It's just, the thing is so dumb. Obviously, it's not in the books. It looks good in 3D, Andrew. Oh, yeah, right. They were high on 3D back then, too. So, <laughs> oh, man, it was so bad. It's like, why? Yeah. I get why they wanted to. I, I hate to contradict myself. They wanted to create a, a, a bigger climax for the final movie. But this was the wrong way to go. I agree. Opinion. I hated the whole climax of Deathly Hallows Part 2. It sucked. Well, this should be fun. <laughs> Micah, you're going to try to defend this decision? I, you know, honestly, number one, I can't believe I'm defending David Yates. And number two, uh. given my next point that we're going to talk about after this, this just seems really weird, but I'm going to try. And it kind of goes to a point you raised, Andrew. You needed an epic final battle sequence, and you couldn't just have them meet in the great hall and duel it out you needed to go through the grounds of hogwarts and <laughs> the, that whole concept of them morphing into each other was symbolic in that these two had been connected since the beginning of the series and here they are in the final moments they're still connected to each other so harry pulling voldemort off the uh ledge there that was the element of surprise. Voldemort didn't have time to react. He's more concerned about just staying alive himself. And I would say that I think the final duel between the two of them, it looked good on screen, but you had to get there somehow. And the fact that they're battling each other all around the Hogwarts grounds, it's a movie. You need the you need the build up to to the final confrontation and I think they delivered on that. What do you think of Harry's line where he's like, let's finish this the way we started it, Tom, together. together. He pulls you him know, that, I, that line, I don't particularly mind. It's everything else that happens after that line yeah. that fucks me. Right. I haven't stated my opinion yet on this, but I agree with Micah, actually. And uh, it makes for a good movie. Huh. Wow. That was what they're trying to do. Make a good movie, right? So yeah. I, I would say that that whole flying yeah. with the pyrotechnics and the thing is... How about a, a, just a better duel on the ground? A better wand duel on the ground? Like the, well, like the okay, Dumbledore that Voldemort to, one at the end of Order of the Phoenix. That speaks to what Laura is going to be talking about on her thing. I think there were a couple of problems they avoided by doing this whole flying thing instead. All right. Well, I just, I really wish that didn't happen in uh, Deathly Hallows Part 2. If I had a VHS tape, I would cut that portion of my VHS Ooh. tape <laughs> out and just stitch the two areas together that uh, should have cut from one to the next. Not to bring up another past episode, but when we did interview David Yates on episode 235 of MuggleCast, we talked about this. So kind of like, I, I love... Andrew, how you're, you know, you're calling out moments that we can reference back to past episodes for guests <laughs> that we've had on the show that will never come on again. So uh, <laughs> See, I kept my mouth shut during these interviews. I don't know if I was a part of that David Yates interview. You're being a good soldier. Here's a quote from David. Again, all the MuggleCast transcripts are on the website. Uh, so this is very easy. 
I wanted that final confrontation between the two of them to be a little bit more expansive. Sorry, I should do this in my David Yates voice. And so that he had a greater sense of climax, given that we had spent so long with those characters and their animosity and their hatred for each other. So it felt to me as though it would be, I'm back to Eric, so it would be much more personal and dynamic if they were to head off away from the rest of everyone and continue fighting. So that was the idea behind it. We had an earlier version of it, which finished in a similar way to the book. And it worked really well in the book. But in a movie, I think we needed a more kinetic conclusion. Oh, all right. He said kinetic, meaning movement. Okay. Get that deleted scene, though, Andrew. Oh, you know what? Here's a quote regarding the morphing. As though they were one. For me, it kind of captured so much of their odd relationship together that they're kind of one, but they're not one in a weird kind of way. And so it was mainly to make sure that the movie felt like it had a theatrical enough ending to satisfy all the fans of the books and all the fans of the movie. You see, David and I agree. How is that satisfying? Morphing. Oh, they morphed. Wow, they are kind of one. Oh my gosh. I think it's cool. I I argued at the time we saw that movie that it was thematically very interesting. And Eric, I really enjoyed the impersonation. I can say... like for that interview, I was literally sitting across the desk from him, and he is probably mm-hmm. the most soft spoken person I've ever he is met. The kindest, most soft spoken. Yes, yeah, he's, he's Winnie the Pooh. All right, Micah, what would you change? So, switching gears, doing a complete 180 off of is what it? I just defended. <laughs> <laughs> switching gears from director talk to director talk. Yeah, but instead of defending them, I'm going to be criticizing them. So, I just feel that the series as a whole had too many directors. So the Harry Potter movie series um, suffered from too many changes in directors, eight films, four directors, and consistency matters. And its lack thereof resulted in many favorite moments and plot lines not making the final cut and characters being completely eliminated for reasons like pacing. Um, You know, I'm I'm thinking also just the layout of Hogwarts, where we spend a good amount of time. It changed drastically going from Chamber of Secrets to Prisoner of Azkaban, right? The location of Hagrid's hut changed. The Whomping Willow got a makeover. They added the covered bridge. The front door was accessed via a courtyard versus the front lawn. And to me, like if you're a fan of the series, especially when it comes to seeing it brought to life, you want consistency. And I think the problem is every time you bring in a new director, they want to put their own spin on things And we didn't really get a practice hand until Order of the Phoenix. Yes, we had Chris Columbus for the first two, but it wasn't until David Yates came on board that we had consistency through the final four films. Well, first of all, I think you might get your wish with Fantastic Beasts. It looks like David Yates is going to be directing all five of those movies, so you'll get some consistency there. Second of all, I think what's so great about franchises is that so many of them do have different directors. You get these different visions. You get these different takes on the story. So while things don't exactly line up, it's kind of like these movies are starting off on a blank slate when they get these new directors. In terms of the locations of like, you know, Hagrid's Hut moving or the Whomping Willow getting a makeover, that I don't think that's necessarily the director's fault. It might be to an extent, but there are a lot of other people who are working on these movies who are working on the entire franchise. So I would put the blame more on them, especially somebody like um, Stuart Craig, the production designer. Mm. I'm okay with David Yates directing all five Fantastic Beast movies for now, but I wish that there were more directors for the Harry Potter film series. I don't like that David Yates took on the final four movies. Yeah, I mean, if you look at Star Wars, even just the original trilogy before Ron Howard, Gareth Edwards, Ryan Johnson, all the other guys got to do JJ, of course, the original trilogy was all different directors. You have Star Wars by George Lucas, uh, Empire Strikes Back was Irvin Kirshner, and somebody named Richard Marquand did Return of the Jedi. What it gives you is different, different looking films, different feeling films, slightly, subtly, but it's still clearly in the same universe and it's still clearly a continuation of the series. But each of those films has its own flair and its own, uh, I guess there's like a French word, something about vivre that I'm thinking of. But anyway, so I think the change in directors has a potential to be a very good thing for something that's going to last as long as eight films. Yeah. Look how many people loved Prisoner of Azkaban. Thanks to Alfonso Cuaron coming in. 
and just doing his own take on it. Much to my dismay. I know. I can't I know. stand some, it as an adaptation. I know some people are definitely upset, but others, it was just such a refreshing change after the first two movies. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I think also, too, when you bring in those different perspectives, they're sacrificing different things. Like, for example, with Alfonso Cuaron, you bring him in, he adds a more artistic flair to the films, right? I'm thinking of the Whomping Willow killing the bird every time a new season starts <laughs> or like the little ice um, coverings that come over the plants yeah. when the dementors are are close by, you know, and, and there's probably a dozen other examples of that. But when you're watching that, it's also taking time away from telling the Marauders backstory. So right. there are <laughs> arguments that can be made both ways. And I think if you look at the series overall, the one thing the Harry Potter films did have with the exception being at the director position was consistency. The cast was consistent throughout An the entire An amazing achievement, films. by the way. The producers, yeah. right? David Heyman and David Barron were consistent. Steve Clovis as a screenwriter, with the exception of Order of the Phoenix, is there the entire time. Yep. Why would you not then look to have consistency at arguably the most important position, and that's the director? So that's my thought. Well, on here's that. the other thing to keep in mind. Some of these directors just want out. It takes over their <laughs> lives. I'm serious. I'm serious. People do not like committing to a franchise for an extended period of time because they have no other life. They and they, they have no other cinematic life. They have to stay committed to this one particular film series, and it's exhausting for people. I yeah, you well, know this this has happened with with the Twilight and Hunger Games franchises too. But you're also directing the highest grossing film franchise of all time. So Micah, Micah, money does not buy happiness. Um, and David Yates isn't the one collecting <laughs> all that money, even though hey, they might pay him. It sure more. helps. It, well, yeah, I guess. But your name is forever attached to the the highest grossing film franchise. Franchise, most successful from film franchise. Of Who all time. needs their name attached to all five thousand movies? Isn't one or two okay? <laughs> like... <laughs> <laughs> it was. I mean, Chris Columbus famously said he wanted to spend more time with his family. He was raising children. Yeah. Uh, when that and casting half of them in the movie, so it's probably he was just better, disappointed. Yeah. Haley Joe didn't get the role of Harry Potter, so he was out <laughs> <Right>. after two. <laughs> <laughs> they wanted him to do the third movie at least, but. He's he said he could, and this just shows you how exhausted these directors are by the time they reach the end of these movies. They they yep. they don't care if they're working on the biggest franchise of all time. They want out. <laughs> they are exhausted. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of somebody that must have been exhausted fairly early on in the production crew uh, of the Harry Potter films, my complaint has to do with the wardrobe. I think that the wardrobe department just must have just quit or wanted something to do, either or. My complaint about the en entire movie adaptations is plain clothes Hogwarts students. <laughs> by, by about midway into the Harry Potter movies, you got these Abercrombie and Fitch striped sweaters, bright pink jackets. Uh, the kids are walking around this school of magic looking like they came out of my Dumbledore. high school. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, it, well, bright. Yeah. Dumbledore is allowed to be flamboyant. Everyone. He gets a pass. Everyone else. This regular street clothes, like stuff that I would have worn in the. I'm just kidding. I'm not that stylish. You just can't. I just I cannot handle it. This is a school for magic. Give me long billowy <laughs> robes. Not not only because I want to see them like I want to see how they work. I want to see like having to do extraordinary feats of magic in robes. I want to see it done because in my mind's eye in the books, it's done. In the books, they even have hats. They have pointy wizard caps. And I think even J.K. Rowling realized how not practical that was because they only appear in the first book. But yeah, give me full on wizard dress robes. This is not a freaking hot topic. You're not going to see the latest, uh, you know, boy band concert. Okay, MCR is not headlining Hogwarts. Why do I have to keep saying this? You can't just wear whatever the hell you want to Hogwarts. Wear your damn robes. You are wizards, people. I'm sick of it. Eric's biased because he's a cosplayer. He needs he needs some inspiration. <laughs> and if they're wearing Abercrombie and Fitch, he can't be inspired. I was not expecting to be called out for my own personal fashion choices here. No, no. I'm saying you're a cosplayer. Yeah. You want to look like the the characters in the books. Yeah. And if they look like yeah. everyday Eric, there's nothing to uh, cosplay. I think that's fair. I didn't even see that. I didn't see that coming. You know, I'm your Eric, therapist. If they, so. they would have 
kept Chris Columbus, then you would have had those robes throughout the entire series. Which is I, actually, I love that you brought that up because I think it was specifically in effort to be different. This is one of those like the ice crystals. I like that, by the way. I like the art, you know, whole style. But the departure, it, it was like such a um, a sharp edge that needed to be done. So all of a sudden, yeah, why Harry? Why wouldn't Harry? Or why wouldn't Hermione just wear jeans um, half the time? Like, you know, but I think it was done for the wrong reasons. And then it stuck because Poirot had started it. Um, everyone else thought that it was like the coolest thing ever and also probably saved them money on black wool fabric. Um, and then they just went that way forever. So it's like the all of the most iconic scenes from the later books, like I don't say meeting Grop in the forest. Forget about that. But all the best scenes, they're wearing street clothes. And I think it's stupid. I just can't stand it. I'm like, these are wizards. This is magic. This is not. I actually look to Harry Potter for escapism. Some people look to Harry Potter to like see themselves. I don't want to see myself. I want to see wizards in robes, waving wands, doing spells. And it just kills it for me if they're all allowed to be, you know, regular old teenagers in street clothes. So I have kind of mixed feelings on this. I'm defending this. On the one hand, I definitely agree that starting in Prisoner of Azkaban, the clothes weren't right. They were too modern because we know that the stories took place in the 90s. So they were wearing clothes that were very modern at the time the movies were filmed. Uh. And that just didn't feel right. I feel like if they had gone for like a street clothes vibe that fit the 90s, maybe some tie dye. I don't know. Tides <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, but I think that there there was a way to do the street clothes that could have been less distracting. And it mm. sounds like, Eric, like it was distracting for you. Like it kind of took you out of the movie. And that's why I would draw your attention to the first Harry Potter film where they do indeed wear plain clothes on a couple of very specific occasions in that film. Um, in particular, the night that they are leaving Gryffindor Tower to go break in and take the Philosopher's slash Sorcerer's Stone, whatever your preference is there. Um, they're wearing plain clothes. They're not wearing robes. Mm. But the clothes that they were wearing were... I would say more discreet, like less flashy. Khakis and a sweater. I'm yeah, thinking. exactly. Exactly. Like like knit sweaters, like things that didn't feel out of place for the environment. So I think if they had stuck with that throughout the rest of the series, it might not have bothered you as much. Um, I yeah. definitely found that everybody did look a little too modern, a little too trendy. But I think that they still could have done plain clothes without being that flashy. Yeah, you know, so many strikes. I think it was all about the balance. The balance was just out of whack in terms of wizard's clothes versus muggle clothes. Maybe they went too heavy on the muggle clothes starting in Prisoner of Azkaban. Yeah, and they just never recovered. I'll agree with that. I will say that Prisoner of Azkaban is the story where we start to see more of the characters outside of an academic environment. Mm -hmm. Why would you wear your school uniform if you're not at school? Well, going to Hogsmeade is still a school trip and it's next to the castle. Like, I don't know. Why wouldn't you be in Hogsmeade? I think you would almost be protected or be favored if you were a Hogwarts student. All the Hogsmeade people want to sell to you. So it makes sense to me that you would show off or wear still like your badge or something from Hogwarts when in Hogsmeade, at least. Yeah, I'm reading a comment from Rachel in the Discord who says, in boarding and private education, the uniform policy is normally super strict for the academic week, but then you get freedom at the weekend. Although if you're still on school grounds, there's rules. Uh, as to what you can wear, but it doesn't sound like you're necessarily required to wear uniforms at all times unless you're, you know, attending academic functions. I think that's what I'm striving for. Yeah, just a little bit more of the, okay, so you can wear plain clothes, but like, it's to your point, Laura, like at Christmas or like in the evenings or whatever, but have it still follow a set of guidelines and have it be nothing trendy made in the thousands. All right, Laura, what is your change? <sighs> so this is, I mean, it's a change slash gripe that I would make. 
And it's that they started using the priori incantatum effect and it felt like every damn duel after the Goblet of Fire film. (laughs) This is the very specific effect where when two brother wands try to fight each other, they can't, and then they're connected. And you see this in, of course, Goblet of Fire, where it's appropriate. But then you see it happen again in Order of the Phoenix when Dumbledore and Voldemort are battling in the Ministry of Magic. They don't have brother wands. (laughs) This is, I think, just them recycling an effect that they thought worked really well and established, like, consistency in fight scenes for the audience that maybe, like, was more of a fan of the movie than the book and Mm. wouldn't really know the difference. Mm -hmm. But it really bothers me because this is a very distinct thing in the books. And I actually want to read you a passage. This is from Goblet of Fire um, from the Priori Incantatum chapter. Suddenly, Harry's wand was vibrating as though an electric charge were surging through it. His hand seized up around it. He couldn't have released it if he'd wanted to. And a narrow beam of light connected the two wands, neither red nor green, but bright, deep gold. And what do they do? Every time they use this effect, they have red and green flames going out and meeting each other in the middle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, Stupid. It's, it's very <laughs> Gryffindor versus Slytherin. Yeah. And it like drives home again that stereotype of like one of these people is pure good. One of these people is pure evil. It's, it's just yeah, not yeah. very nuanced. I totally agree with this. And and I think, you know, I remember our conversation from a couple of weeks ago where we were going through all the fan made films and just how great those battle sequences were. And then you look yeah. at something that literally has hundreds of millions of dollars in production and they can't get it right. And that just <laughs> drives me nuts. I think visually, I don't know. I don't know. I can't. But see, that's the thing. That's where I went to. It's like, of course they did it because visually it could provide some consistency in these battles between what are considered to be very powerful wizards, right? Mm-hmm. Like, They're so powerful that they can't overcome each other immediately. So their spells meet in the middle and they have to concentrate on like mentally pushing. Yeah. Yeah, It's a visual visual way of showing evenly matched individuals. Mm -hmm. It's like the the loading bar or status bar of the wall. In the the ministry, Dumbledore looked like he needed a pair of sunglasses because he was just like, (laughs) yeah, I, I... Did not like that scene. Oh, don't Mm. even get me into the whole Pokemon battle they did in that. Like, (laughs) do you remember? Like, I rewatched this scene the other night, and it's like Dumbledore is like using wandless magic to like ball up a bunch of water from the fountain and put Voldemort in it. I think it's cool. Yeah, I really like that scene. I gotta admit. (laughs) I gotta admit. (laughs) And oh, and again, it looks great in 3D. (laughs) (laughs) That's not why I liked it. I am so glad that as a culture, we're getting past 3D. Yeah, Hollywood tried yeah. it, make some more money at yeah. the box office. It didn't really work out. Thank goodness. Meanwhile, Squirtle's in the background. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I Watching that scene, I felt like somebody was going to be like, Pikachu, I choose you. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, but Dumbledore, like there's... There are very specific parameters set around this in the book. Dumbledore says they will not work properly against each other. Um, If, however, the owners of the wands force the wands to do battle, a very rare effect will take place. And we see the effect take place during Harry and Voldemort's final battle in Deathly Hallows, but they weren't using brother wands anymore. Yeah. (laughs) So it shouldn't have happened. It's a climactic. Yeah. I think we all understand why they decided to stick with this effect and this this look and this type of duel but yeah for fans it's for book fans it's very frustrating yeah. right and i will say i was just reading deathly hallows to get you know get myself more current on that and reading over it i was like oh my god is this an example of how a movieism influenced the book and i want to get y'all's opinion here cuz i think it is maybe a little vague a little unclear 
Um, so when Harry and Voldemort cast Avada Kedavra and Expelliarmus at the same time, it says, The bang was like a cannon blast and the golden flames that erupted between them at the dead center of the circle they had been treading marked the point where the spells collided. Harry saw Voldemort's jet green mean his own his own spell. Meet his own spell. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it sounds hmm. to me like this was maybe because this sounds very different. And it should be different because, again, they're not battling using brother wands, but it sounds very similar to the way this effect was portrayed in the films. Yeah. Hmm. It just makes me wonder if there was a little bit of influence there. Maybe. Yeah. I hate to think that that type of thing occurs. You know, we've talked about how, like, actors potentially influence the writing of the books. So, well, green has always been associated with the killing curse, right? In the books. Yes. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. But it's more so you're saying, like, they're meeting right at the center, and it's very similar to what we see happen in the final yeah. showdown. But then at the same time, it describes golden flames erupting between them, which is consistent with the book description of the first time we see Priori and Cantatum in Goblet of Fire. So to me, it feels like the streams are being crossed here a little bit v between like book canon and movie canon. Yeah. yeah. Right. And it's also worth mentioning, I don't know if one of our um, patrons wrote in about this, but the actual end scene with Voldemort kind of just, I don't even know how to describe it. He just kind of like evaporates into thin air. That always bothered it's, me. Yeah. yeah. Instead of leave, yeah, it was a very important point in the book that Voldemort leave his corpse behind because he wasn't special. He wasn't, you know, he was just in the end. He had a dead body like everyone else's. Well, Bellatrix had a similar effect too, right? Where she yeah. mm -hmm. kind of imploded, yeah. disintegrated. And, that's the word. Yeah, there, I'm there for. you go. That's the word. <laughs> and maybe that was just their way of killing off the evil side. But I just, I mean. It's not like we haven't seen the killing curse used in the films right. and the effect that that has. It's time for a word from our second sponsor this week, Quip. And I want to talk about one of their newer products, chewing gum. You may not know that gum is the unsung hero when it comes to better oral health. Plus, we all know it's fun and refreshing to chew during the day. The American Dental Association recommends chewing sugar-free gum for 20 minutes after meals. Quip's new gum is actually good for your oral health and comes with a dispenser that'll remind you of the one-click candy you loved as a kid. It's a sturdy little dispenser that you can easily pocket for when you're on the go. Quip gum can help prevent cavities and freshen breath when chewed for 20 minutes after eating. It's sugar-free and has tooth-friendly xiatol with zero calories. And to satisfy your taste buds, Quip added a long-lasting mint flavor and crunchy tri-layer design. They are very good. And in a world where we all need to be extra safe and hygienic, the quick release button means you can still share with friends. No wrappers, hands, or hassles. Add a gum refill plan for a gift that keeps on giving all year round. It's not a substitute for brushing and flossing, but this is great support for your oral health. Pair it with a Quip electric toothbrush for adults and kids, refillable floss, and more great products. Quip is simply your one-stop shop for everything concerning the health of your mouth, and all their products are very innovative, in my opinion. And if you go to getquip.com slash muggle right now, you can get a free plastic dispenser with any gum refill plan. That's a free dispenser at get quip.com slash muggle spelled g-e-t-q-u-i-p dot com slash muggle you can also find the quip electric toothbrush refillable floss and more in the oral care aisle at your local walmart quip is the good habits company okay we received some submissions from listeners as well these cover the books and the movies micah kick us off yeah, so first off, we heard from Danielle about the movies, and she says, how the movies got less colorful as they went on. You can't even watch the last two movies during the day because they're so dark. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody mashed up every frame of every Harry Potter movie into one image, and you can visually see the films getting darker over time. As we make fun of here on the show from time to time, the 
cast and crew when promoting each new movie would say it's the darkest one yet it's the darkest one yet and uh <laughs> yeah. literally it was the darkest movie yet <laughs> every just, time. as somebody who's run MuggleNet's caption contest for 17 years now uh i can say it's grueling pulling uh screenshots that work from the later harry potter films you just i up the brightness by at least like 150 each time it's insane <laughs> just to be able to see what's on the damn screen yeah i'm pulling from the blu-rays it's not a clarity issue it's the, the lighting of the scene issue awful i just put a graphic into our rundown and you guys can see how the movies start off brighter and then as it goes on darker 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 there's one bright moment at the end it's when harry's in limbo with dumbledore other than that oh i love this oh, yeah. this feature that takes a a uh screenshot or uh, the the predominant color of any one frame and then gives you all the frames of the movies yeah yeah and it's like totally black yeah you can see right where half-blood prince is everything is green <laughs> <laughs> just like the cover yep <laughs> that's what it is andrew mary grand prix had some influence on the last couple of films <sighs> so the next one comes from steph uh, with a book complaint, I got super invested in the Tonks Lupin relationship, and their book Death gets such minimal notice that I missed it altogether the first time I read through Deathly Hallows. Mm. I agree. Um, not only does their death feel cheap, it is not given the same amount of screen time as Fred's and some of the other deaths that are occurring during those moments. I can see easily how someone could might miss the fact that they died and i'm sorry that you did i think rolling has implied before that that that's war things happen in a flash and there's not time to focus on all the death yeah each death okay this next one comes from caitlin and it's a movie gripe my absolute biggest critique in deathly hallows part two harry breaks the elder wand and throws it away rather than fixing his own wand first it would have taken five extra seconds to include <laughs> yeah this, i remember seeing this and being like what why <laughs> it's edgy save it yeah yeah all right this next one is from julianne it concerns the movies it drives me nuts that they didn't include Spew in the movies. It's such an important piece of Hermione's character development. She goes big, but doesn't necessarily go about it the best way, considering that she doesn't really include the house elves in her effort to improve conditions for the house elves. But then she seems to learn from this and do a much better job creating Dumbledore's army and make something really powerful happen. That development is completely missed out on in the movies. I agree. If TV adaptation, if that ever happens, they need to include Spew. Because there's also just a lot to say there, especially, uh, you know, it could, it could also be a commentary on, on the muggle world. What's going on here? Yeah, I, I think unfortunately here, it was just a lot to do with the fact that house elves in general weren't included in the movie. So it's hard to include Spew without mm -hmm. the house elves. You know, more money. They didn't have enough money for the house elves, pacing, all that stuff we hear so much right, about. Right, they had to give it all to David Yates to direct a billion Harry Potter movies. That's right. Right. Every time the same director gets retained, they get an up in their salary because it's like, hey, I'm still doing good work. And so maybe that's why there's no not the same director for all eight films. Well, speaking of uh, pacing and character development, Issy writes in about both the book and the movie – as it relates to Grop's existence. I love the idea of giving Hagrid some family, but Grop is used purely in both the books and the films as a one scene moment. His character is completely devoid of any development and just an excuse to get them away from Umbridge when there are, were a million more inventive ways to do so. Hard agree with Issy here. Grop, unfortunately, is useless. It's a good observation. I hadn't thought about that before. Isn't Grop in the final battle too? I mean, he's one of several yeah, dozen like a background like, character. creatures in the yeah yeah. It's not like it's not like he wins the war for them. He's no Neville. <laughs> Can you imagine if Grop had the same kind of glow up as Neville did? <laughs> this one comes from Erica. It's a movie complaint. I can't get over how they added Bellatrix burning down the burrow in Half Blood Prince. Half Blood Prince is one of the best books. Yeah, but it has made that movie completely unwatchable to me. Well, I don't know about making it completely unwatchable, but I know we've also been very critical of that scene that they added. And I remember, again, going back to what the crew has to say about decisions like this. 
uh, they wanted to uh, add in a little more fear, a little more darkness into the movie. And this was their way of doing that. A feeling that the danger has come home, that it has really reached. Yeah. Nowhere is safe. It, it has breached your front porch. Yeah, thematically, I think it works for the reasons that they mm-hmm. stated. I just wish I could see it. Even the fire looks dark and gray. (laughs) Well, and also don't worry because their house is just fixed in the next movie. So it's magic. Mm -hmm. The whole thing's held together by magic to begin with. It's magic. It's the cornfields protecting them, I think. The movie opens in a very similar way, right? Where they uh, take out the bridge in London. Yeah, so so cool. To that, that point about instilling fear. Uh, I agree. But uh, again, when we're talking about things being left out, this is another example of where possibly instead of spending time and money on burning down the burrow, you could have been going back into one of the memories that uh, were left out of Half-Blood Prince. Oh, you mean like actually Merope Gaunt leaving baby Tom at the orphanage Mm. and getting more of that? Something (laughs) like that. Or uh, Bob Ogden visiting the uh, Riddle home. Oh, so the Gaunt home, excuse me. All right. This next one is from Angela. It's a book complaint. I wish we would have had more time on Harry and Ginny's relationship growth. Yeah. Um, I, there are certain things that the book uh, does wrong with that, like omitting the three weeks of their relationship, the happiest time of their lives. But the movies do it even worse. Um, the movies just totally botch her development and it's it's a huge crime eric aren't you filling that void i am filling that void it is an ongoing (laughs) people are asking you got you got to get you got to get that out already it's been nearly two years but by july it will be finished by july all right all right george i'm gonna call you george rr martin (laughs) I, uh, i deserve that title i deserve it eric do you think that you could share a small excerpt of your fan fiction on next week's episode when we talk about fan fiction the first two chapters, uh, which I've written of the fanfic, are available. I read them out loud. Our friends at uh, Fanatical Fix podcast, and I recorded that audio with them, and it's actually on our Patreon. So I'll just draw people's attention back to that. Beautiful. All wow. Right. Is it called The Winds awesome. of Weasley? The Winds of Weasley. <laughs> I will say, apart from George R. R. Martin being a much more successful writer than me, uh, the comparisons are very apt, and I'm deeply hurt by that. But yes, Eric's the first true. author to record the audiobook before the book is even finished. That's a remarkable achievement. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually a great segment. Yeah, what happens and, when it goes to your editor? You have to re-record everything. <laughs> oh yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But nevertheless, it's fun. And I am really seriously working on filling that void. The movies just obliterate all of a lot of these characters, unfortunately. All right. This next one's from Jill, also concerning the book. It annoys me that J.K.R. folded Snape into her theme of love as portrayed in the books. J.K.R. portrays many healthy kinds of love in the books, and Snape's version of love is not one of them. That kind of obsessive, single-minded devotion is unhealthy and shouldn't be regarded as a redeeming character arc for him. He made a ton of bad choices and abused children along the way to his final moments as a character. Loving someone does not justify this. I wish JKR had a different character arc for him in the end. It's a little twisted to see how so many people consider him to be a paragon of the love redeems all theme from the books. Interesting take there. Love that. Yeah. All right, get ready, Eric, because Chelsea writes in... On the book front about book five, Sirius. In Goblet of Mm. Fire, we see a Sirius who is loving, supportive, concerned, and an excellent role model and father figure to Harry. Book five, we see a moody, adolescent, bitter man who is selfish and withdrawn. I know you've discussed this before and said it's his lack of development as a person due to spending 12 years in jail. However, I can't help to think It was just to distance the reader from Sirius, to soften the blow when he died. It would have been a hundred times more devastating to have compassionate, fatherly Sirius killed than this distant, moody, selfish man. Personally, I would rather have had the lovable Sirius die without his character being blemished and deal with the devastation. I love this. I think it's important that that the book did highlight Sirius's flaws and bring them to light in a very real way. I don't think it's um, unrealistic that Sirius had those very specific issues that like Molly and them bring up in book five. But I think that Sirius was done dirty by the author. The decision to kill him did end up resulting in a lot of 
I think negative aspects being more prominent during the last year of his life. And I think that this is spot on um, because in book four, the, the joy that you get thinking about Sirius literally in paradise using sending Harry a different tropical bird every week writing to him. You just think that here's a competent wizard who is living his best life and eluding like the stupid policeman. Uh, you know, it, it just gives you a lot of hope and book five is a real downer. So I get that a hundred percent. Yeah, I would say, I mean, I know that uh, Chelsea brings up the fact that we've made the argument that he spent 12 years in jail, but it's also like he's being sent right back to jail. And and I think that has a lot to do with his attitude and his personality, right? He gets essentially locked down in book five, and then he's on the run in book four. So it, it's not like his life has changed all that much. He's just in a different kind of prison. So I, I <laughs> isn't that life in general? <laughs> yeah, but I, I think you can you can't necessarily fault him for that type of behavior. So this next one comes from Allie. It's a book complaint. I'm currently rereading from the start, and all the fat shaming is making me deeply uncomfortable. It's pretty much nonstop in the scenes with the Dursleys for the first four books or so, which I find especially problematic because it's used to completely unnecessarily underpin the negative characterization of Dudley and Vernon. I'm still hoping to read the books to my kids someday, but I will definitely be altering those descriptions as I go because I absolutely don't want them to grow up with the same internalized weight stigma I did. Mm. This may be one of the best responses we've gotten total. It's 100% fair and accurate. Mm. Yeah, I opinion. think this is one of those things that if this series was written from scratch again today, elements like this would probably not be included. Right. Like Roald Dahl does this a lot too. Um, characters that are bad on the inside are described as like obese and grotesque on the outside. And it's sort of a trope in fiction writing. I agree with you. It would not be written the same today, even if written by the same author. I think there might be some more consideration there. Yeah. Um, right. But yeah, the early books, oh, all about Dudley's double chin. Mm -hmm. All about it. Mm -hmm. Right. And you can probably, since she is part of the family here, add Aunt Marge to this as well. Right. Yeah. yeah. And who hasn't had a double chin at some point? I mean, really. <laughs> <laughs> We've all been there. I think pretty much <laughs> everybody has a double with. chin these days, too. It's just like yeah, impossible not to. In the year of COVID. Yeah, that's true. This last submission comes from Katie, and it's a gripe about something not being represented in the films that we saw more of in the books. Katie says, the lack of sassy Harry in the films. So many great lines and moments that remind us that Harry is still just a teenager going through school, such as, there's no need to call me Sir Professor, and that's my nickname in talking about the Runal Waslib <laughs> moment <laughs> where he yeah, grabbed you know, Ron's potions book. Me. Yeah. <laughs> All great moments that lead to him sassing and teasing Tom in the final battle before him having a very human death, which is another pet peeve from the movies. I think it would have made the films a little more appealing to some folks. All right. Well, lots to change for future adaptations of Harry Potter. <laughs> book or movie <laughs> yeah and i think it's also right to say that we critique because we love right yes. like we've had a lot of fun today obviously some observations are more serious than others but this is just part of doing like critical textual analysis y'all yeah we criticize because we care that's a very good reminder and it's a lot of fun to talk about stuff like this of course we mm -hmm. love the books and movies for many reasons but that's not as fun of a discussion what do you love about harry potter oh well here's what i love about harry potter everybody <laughs> knows we love harry potter in in, in many ways I, I was serious about americanizing the book titles though we'll take care <laughs> of it we're on it if you the listener have any feedback about today's discussion you can email mugglecast at gmail.com or send a voice memo to that email address using the voice memo app on your phone. You can also call 19203Muggle. That's 19203684453. We have a Muggle Mail episode coming up in a couple weeks, and I'm sure we'll revisit this topic then. And I think down the road we'll do another installment of this discussion because there are so many elements to talk about. Like I said, we received many, many submissions from our listeners. So we'll get to those in the future. It's time for Quizage. 
last week's question. What two phrases do the twins bewitch Percy's badge to say? Looking for two phrases from two different books. This is a really interesting one. We were talking about the Weasley twins on last week's discussion, which I have to say was very well received. Very happy about that. In Chamber of Secrets, the twins bewitch Percy's prefect badge to read Pinhead. And in Prisoner of Azkaban, they bewitch his head boy badge to read Big Head Boy. So those were the two answers I was looking for. Uh, entries by George's Ear, who participated. Wow. And, and Swaggy Maggie uh, were actually incorrect. They mentioned Humongous Big Head, not Big Head Boy. So sorry about that play again. But correct answers were submitted by, I mention only because of the cool usernames. I really want those uh, people to continue submitting. But uh, Suhis, Jojo B, Ali F, Shannon, Delesh, Kirost, Ellen, Ryan, Hunter, Irene, Hi, Jason King, Stephen, Bort Voldemort, Caitlin Yang, Asuna, and others got the correct answer. Congratulations, everyone. And next week's question. What is the British television series from 2003, which was directed by Harry Potter director David Yates and scored by Harry Potter composer Nicholas Hooper? looking for the name of the British television series. And submit your answer over on the MuggleCast website, mugglecast.com slash quizich. So to wrap up today's episode, if you could take a moment to do the following, we would appreciate it as they all help us continue to grow and run MuggleCast. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to MuggleCast. Follow us on social media. We are MuggleCast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And finally, join our community of passionate listeners today at patreon.com slash MuggleCast. Shout out to all of our patrons because without you, we truly would not be doing the show today. Listener support lets us spend more time in the wizarding world and less time doing boring muggle things by pledging you'll receive instant access to bonus muggle cast the ability to listen to us record live each week early access to each new episode as soon as we finish editing it our facebook and discord groups our monthly ask me anything videos random fandom related posts i posted a very very cool book i discovered in a used bookstore a couple weeks ago people were really liking uh, the pictures i posted and so much more Check out all the benefits at patreon.com slash mugglecast. And thank you for listening to today's episode. I'm Andrew. I'm Eric. I'm Micah. And I'm Maura. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.